So first of all, thank you for this invitation to come here and, and talk about my, my research. Uh, my presentation, in, I will go through some methods that we have used to study groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, I will show you some examples, mainly from the Burrell zone, and stress the importance of uh, why we study these systems in, in Europe and Finland and then go into more details on the boreal systems, the peatlands, their hydrogeology, and present you some, some examples on how these systems are connected to, to fracture rock systems and quaternary systems. So the big part of the fo focus will be on these esker systems. So the methods that we have been used, this is just a, a shot of different type of approaches. Uh, we have used uh, geophysical measurements, like here you show, you can see ground penetrating radar. This is quite easy for us to use, especially in the winter time when the wetlands can be easily accessed. In the summer they are quite wet, so it's uh, not easy to ac actually access these systems. Uh, we use uh, qu quite a lot of isotopic measurements. Here, here you can see uh, Picaro systems that we have currently installed in the field to take online sample samples at the location in northern Finland. Uh, we have used uh, traditional hydrological mod modeling, monitoring, of course, and remote sensing with different type of techniques, from helicopters to satellites, drones. Uh, we try to combine everything into numerical uh, modeling. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And also, we, we do work with uh, groups in ecology at our university and sociology uh, with stakeholder involvement and participation participation to solve practical problems that we have with some of these aquifers and uh, ecosystems. So why are these uh, systems important in, in Europe and, and Finland? First of all, uh, you know Finland is a country of thousand lakes and actually peatlands and eskers. Uh, some of these systems are really nice and beautiful and we have a lot of summer houses which have, are located on these crystal clear groundwater lakes, so the clearer the water is, the higher social, social value they have, or economic value in a way, in Finland. And most of these systems are groundwater dependent if they are crystal clear lakes, like, like I show here. Uh, also for ecosystems, a lot of, lot of our protected sites in Finland are peatlands. They host different type of red list species, so they have high biodiversity and are protected under the European uh, Habitat Directive as Natura 2000 sites, so they have a strong legal protection. So obviously they, imp they include many different uh, important uh, uh, ecosystems. Uh, then on the other hand, uh, the aquifers connected to these systems, they are used for water abstraction. Uh, in Finland about 70% of our drinking water is from groundwater, so that's a threat to the GDs. And of course uh, land use, and climate change is uh, affecting these systems. Uh, from a European perspective, also in a, in a Finnish perspective, we have this European law, Groundwater Directive, and in that law, there's also a specific uh, need to assess groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, as in with that directive, um, the status of the groundwater dependent ecosystems is also determining the status of the whole aquifer system. So the status of the ecosystem needs to be good for the whole aquifer system to have a good status. So it, it, has, it has this type of legal, legal commitment to, to deliver water to these ecosystems. But the problem is normally that we really don't know how these systems are connected to the aquifers. So uh, this has been a big lack in understanding uh, related to management, how to manage the groundwater abstraction and the groundwater use in such a way that those ecosystems are not affected. So that is one of the backgrounds of, of, of my research as well. So, of course, everyone knows the boreal zone. It's in the northern part. Uh, and the important aquifers in these zones, of course, are, are, are those formed after the last deglaciation period. Quaternary deposits of different type of sand and gravel deposits such as eskers that I will, I will talk later about. 
And, but different types of sand and gravel formations are important systems. And there are quite many of them. Like in Finland, we have classified 3,000 groundwater bodies. We also have fracture rock systems that I will mention a little bit, as I worked with those mainly in Norway. Uh, my special interest also is peatlands. And you, here you can see a global map of peatland by, by Lappalainen. And you can see mainly those are distributed in the, in the same zone as the boreal zone and around the equator. So basically the area where we have a lot of uh, uh, water in excess. So in the talk, I will try to link uh, the hydrogeology with the, with the GDEs that are found uh, and a certain focus on peatlands, as these are very common in the boreal zone. I will also say a few words about the uh, fracture rock systems and GDEs, and, and uh, some, something about the peatlands. So I will start this by, by presenting some information about peatlands, as, as I've been working a lot with, with those systems. Uh, well, ba basically peatlands are, we, we have two broad classifications. We have systems that are depending on precipitation as a main water source. We call them normally bogs. And then we have soil water influenced peatlands, which we call fens. These are very common in Finland, and we believe the name con Finland comes from, from this term, fenland. But these are influenced by soil water and groundwater. Also, the bogs might be, but, but, but the classification is typically like this. And it, this classification represented here is made by a botanist, uh, Moen, in Norway. What is important for hydrogeology, of course, is the structure of the peat. So this is a cross-section of uh, typical peatland. What we have is uh, on the top, we have the living layer, or a quickly decomposing layer of uh, vegetation and peat. Uh, normally, it has a very high hydraulic conductivity. An overland flow occurs in this layer. Then we have the low hydraulic conductivity layer we call catotelm. It might have different layers depending on the stages of the peat development. And very importantly also, we have a third layer, which is the subsoil layer, which can be very variable, uh, in fact, from rock, from base rock to, to gravel to sand to clay, silt. It can be anything almost. To understand the top layer, so it, it has this uh, di or two, two layer structure, dipolectic structure, uh, first introduced by the Russian uh, scientist Sirin and later on by Ingram from UK. But this is very essential to understand the, the processes that occur in the topsoil of the, of, the, of, the, of the peatland where most of the water flow in fact often occurs. So uh, important also to understand is that these systems might be, might be found in different parts of the catchments. Also uh, providing different type of characteristics to these systems from headwater to to, to riverine systems, to coastal systems. If we look at the hydro, hy hydraulic properties of peat, here is some, some sketches of some development on, in the theory. Uh, what we know is that uh, normally we understand that the hydraulic conductivity decreases with depth, or more, more so, decreases with a degree of humification. So here we show uh, a decrease in hydraulic conductivity with uh, von Post degree, which is the main, main characteristics, physical characteristics we use to classify peat. Then we also know in peat there are this type of erosion channels. So it has like a karstic behavior. So you have the matrix and the, and the pipe flows in some type of peats, in both pristine peats and drained peats. You find these type of systems. So obviously the hydraulic conductivity is uh, very high, especially in those channels, because it's uh, well, a channel flow, a pipe flow. When you look at the peatland, this is a picture of the peatland top surface. The water flows there in many different ways. It's an overland flow system, pretty much. It's not the Darcyan flow system at all. Uh, in some cases, at least, it flows, and it's very difficult to determine the flow of, uh, field. But we have de developed some method using stable isotopes, uh, where we can uh, back calculate the the, the flow picture of the peatland. I will return to this later on in, in, in some slides. What is important, of course, in the boreal zone also is the snow and ice. Snow here and the ice in the blue. 
And the characteristics of ice is uh, uh, dominating. It's very important for us to know when we want to understand whether or not the runoff in the spring occurs as overland flow or whether or not the runoff goes through, through the soil. So the, the ice in the peat is kind of uh, partitioning the runoff into these two components, either overland flow or subsurface flow. So therefore, the, the role of the ice is uh, important, especially thinking of climate change, where this might change. What the method we use to, to, to measure hydraulic connectivity in my group is this type of, uh, uh, we call the push infiltrometer, we, that we can push uh, into different layers of the peat, maybe into three, four, five meters, and, and put different type of pressures above. It has also been the used in Germany, and we pretty much are happy with the results we get from this uh, type of measurement device. Well, the overall groundwater flow in this type of wetlands, in general, we, we characterize two main flow types. So it can be this type of what we call ombotrophic systems, where the flow direction is from the wetland to the groundwater system. Or, or we can have groundwater dependent systems where the water, the main water component that goes into the wetland is groundwater. So the pressure in the groundwater is higher than, than in the peatland. In reality, the peatlands are more, more complex and we find different combinations of these. I will go into those a little bit later. Well, we look at temporal processes in peatlands. They are not really well understood so much, but uh, if you look at the left uh, slide, you see peatlands in the, in the valley bottom here, and these are highlands above. This is an example from Scotland, where my postdoc was for two years. And this is modeling the star, the star model. But what is the main feature that they want to show here is, uh, uh, and you see the hydrograph here on the right-hand side, that uh, when we have a lot of uh, rainfall and, ru and runoff ru ru processes, and this is the base flow here, you see only small part of the peatland is contributing to runoff. Whereas when we get peak events, the whole system responds to, to, to the event, event. And this type of information is quite important also if, when we consider peatland protection, that, uh, that the buffer role is uh, really important for, for this peatland in, in these events. And, but we don't really have that much information on these temporal processes in, in these type of systems, I would say. But, but we are getting more and more information on those. So, regarding the, the current knowledge, I would say that, in general, considering uh, peatlands and these type of ecosystems, we, we often have quite uh, poor hydrogeological hydro information. Much of the research in the past has really been looking at the peatland itself, not so much the surrounding aquifer and how it's connected to it. Uh, and, and less so than even the flow patterns that occur within the peatland, even the, the, the um, in, um, in, in the, like a static uh, steady state conditions or even less in the transient uh, condition. So there's a need for research here on, on these issues. Well, I will show you next the examples that I've mentioned earlier. First, a few slides on the fracture rock systems that I worked on and later on going to, into the SCAR systems. So a little bit more into, into detail. Well, as you know, fracture rock that can conduct uh, Water, as you see here, water coming out of this, uh, where the rock type is changing. I'm, I'm not a rock geologist, but that's, that's at least what I know. And looking from air photographs, you can also see kind of zones here with fractures and mapped here. This is a picture from Norwegian Geological Survey. And quite many times we find e ecosystems in these zones. So we find peatlands, small lakes, and groundwater dependent ecosystems are very often found actually in these fracture zones. So one uh, question then is, is uh, when we want to look at these systems, are they con are, what is the contact with, uh, with the water bearing fractures? I mean, how much water comes from these fractures? Is that amount important? And, and if, for example, tunnel construction on drainage occurs, will, will that influence the, the ecosystems or not? Because there's a lot of road construction and tun tunnel construction going around, and, and they, they need the impact assessment whether or not they will influence the ecosystems. So that is an issue we have been working on. 
So here you can see southern Norway and Oslo. And the, this actually is the tunnel uh, from Oslo to the airport, the new airport. And uh, there's a lot of maps you can find in the hydrogeology journal related to this case if you are interested. So what occurred here? Uh, when, the when this tunnel was constructed, you can, you can see there are some lakes here, and the peatlands are these uh, orange dots. And what occurred after the construction is what you see here on the right-hand side. So the water disappeared. So obviously there was a contact between the, between the tunnel and the ecosystem. And this led to a range of research that I was also involved in, uh, and by, by me and Snisper and, and most of all, Jens Kverner, and, um, in, in which we tried to study the, the contact between fracture rock and, and the ecosystems. And it, it appears to be that it, sometimes there is a contact and sometimes there is not, a, not the contact. And especially for, 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 in this case, for the tunnels that are located below the marine, former marine uh, line, which is about 200 meters in Norway, they are not so sensitive to this type of drainage. But if they are above, they are, or m maybe. Well, that's about it from fracture systems. So then I will go into these esker systems. We're now talking about uh, sand deposits, gravel deposits from the past deglaciation period. So you, you can see this type of ridges here, quite beautiful formations, and peatlands, rivers, this type of landscape that you see in the boreal zone. And the, the, the system that I've been working a lot with is this system here uh, called Rokua. It's located in northern Finland. It's one of the biggest eskers we have. It's 30 kilometers long and about five kilometers wide. It has a lot of small surface water lakes, kettle lakes on top. And it rises about 60, 70 meters above the flat area around, which is mainly peatlands. The system uh, depicted here by one of my PhD students. So overall you see that it's, uh, it, it lies on bedrock. It's a gravel, typically has a gravel core. It has about 80 meter of sand. Uh, then you see the peatlands around. They, in this one, one side here, Vinivara, they are pristine. Whereas in the other side we have been studying, they are drained in most, most of the case for agriculture, forestry, or peat harvesting. The, the recharge, as you see, the, it forms on the, on the esker and discharges to the peatlands and to the lakes. So this is the uh, recharge area and this is a discharge area. The peat is uh, partly confining the system. That means that we can also have springs that come out later on, further down, and the, the sand uh, deposits kind of, con the aquifer kind of continues further down uh, down, and these SK ridges can actually be several, uh, maybe five, six, seven hundred kilometers long. Every now popping up in the landscape. So, so it's you know according to the uh, direction of the ice withdrawal. What you also see interesting here are these lakes. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about them later on. Some lakes are are disconnected. They are closed basin lakes, so there's no surface water inflow or outflow. So all the water that comes in and out is from groundwater, precipitation, and evapotranspiration. Then we have some lakes that are connected. They get uh, surface water inflow and outflow. So the main two, two type of lake, lakes. I will talk a little bit about those later on. Uh, then we, have, of course, have headwater streams that are formed from the, from the esker and, and different type of springs. The, the key questions that we, why we studied these sites are, uh, we saw at some of these lakes, they, they had low water quality, and sorry, low, low water level. So the level was declined, and we, we were contacted by, by, the, by the regional authorities to, to find out the reason why. And one, one, the, one hypothesis was that the drainage around the esker uh, has, had lowered the lake levels, so kind of incre increasing the discharge, kind of flow resistance being uh, de decreased. Then the other question was that some of these lakes were oligotrophic and some were eutrophic, uh, nut nutrient rich and nutrient poor. So what's the reason for that? Uh, and then, of course, a, a, some of the, a question also is what is safe abstraction rate 
causes, causing limited uh, impact on the pristine protected peatlands. So these were kind of some of the practical questions behind our research. So if we look at the system here, uh, this is a cross section. Again, you see the drainage and you see the, the hydrological components, the lakes. What we do see here, so these are the two different type of lake types you see, the oligotrophic, the eutrophic, and kind of the water level drawdown on the, on the left-hand side. What we, our main conclusion from, from this study was that it's mainly due to climate variability, that, that these systems uh, sometimes have a low water level and sometimes higher. Especially if we have, uh, let's say, five years in a row, a dry year, then of course the water level goes down. But the, the, it's not like the, the system is quite s slow to react to this, to, to this event. So, so we need to have like two, three dry years in a row to get the water table drawdown in the lakes. Then we classified two main type of, uh, of lakes in this region. So we, ha we have this, uh, these lakes with the water table drawdown are these in the, they have a small capture zone so they are strongly controlled by variation in recharge. Whereas the lower lying lakes, they have a larger capture zone, uh, a larger aquifer behind them, providing a stable water, water level and also leading to outflow from these lakes. And these lakes were eutrophic because the sand is, sandy soils in this uh, esker were phosphorus rich. So it's a natural uh, reason behind the eutrophication. So this is, uh, these systems were affected by climate variability uh, and they were oligotrophic, whereas these are, have stable water level but are eutrophic. So, a little bit about the, next about the recharge and discharge characteristics of the sites. So, of course, uh, a recharge is affected by precipitation and transpiration, leading to recharge. So, the climate control is strong. Also, the vegetation will have an influence. And snow melt is really important, because most of the snow melt forms recharge. If you look at this uh, discharge or exfiltration, it occurs at different spots, obviously. So this is the cross section of the exfiltration. Then if you look from the system above, we might have different type of patterns of how the discharge occurs. It can be maybe concentrated in a few spots in some systems, whereas in others it, it's more diffuse around, around the esker and into different paths. This, of course, depends on the hydrogeology and the, and the, and the geophysical structures of the aquifer. So looking at the recharge, uh, we made a study. This actually shows the different uh, recharge in different areas of the aquifer. Uh, we, we did this by, by co coupling the COOP model and um, Modflow. And COOP because it's very good with uh, dealing with snow and frost. And we, the main innovation here is that we linked this uh, recharge estimation to, to forest inventories. So we were able to use the forest, finished forest inventory data, which is very good and use that as a predictor to, 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 to get the recharge values for these systems. For the discharge in this system, it occurs, you see, as follows here. The big blue dots in, in this corner, in this area, most of the discharge is occurring. Some here, of course. And what we see uh, at the edge of the, of the esker, the edge is here, and these are drained peatlands, uh, that it occurs in the ditches, of course, but then there occurs in concentrated spots due to these pipe flow mechanisms that I showed before. So we see clear pipes coming out of the, of the, of the soil and into the ditches. So it has a high hydraulic conductivity despite the parent low conductivity of the peat. Well, uh, another thing that we, we, we were doing at this site, we, we, we used uh, hydrogeosphere as a model to, to model the aquifer system. Uh, and the key issue, of course, there is how to validate this model. And um, what we did here is um, we observed uh, by thermal observation through helicopter the area and mapped the groundwater discharge points. So with remote sensing. And then we used another method. We developed this uh, 
J index method, where we use isotopic signatures from different lakes taken in the autumn, and, and this method develops uh, the portion of groundwater inflow into the lake. So we use these two approaches to, to validate this, this model, which is the main innovation of that paper. But anyway, here you see the, the observed thermal images. So we, we, we map the inflow in red dots here. This is groundwater inflow to the lakes. This is the hydrogeosphere model. The blue is the water into the uh, recharge, into the aquifer, and the red is go coming out. And you see, if you look at the comparison, and this hydrogeosphere model, I would must say, was done without any uh, calibration. We just inserted the, the measured parameters and the characteristics of the aquifer. So there's no calibration. But we were quite happy with actually the results we, we got from this uh, from this case, quite good agreement. But I think it was important for us to try to, especially this spatial pattern, which is important for us to, to understand uh, how Jess was, was able to, to, to capture that. Then we also we've been working a bit more with those discharge zones, how, how they can be characterized, because we want to uh, understand them better. This is work not yet published, but, but anyway shows you uh, you see the, 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 the purple here is um, cold water going into the lakes and the peatlands. And you see sometimes we don't see anything, whereas sometimes it's really concentrated spot, whereas in other places it's more diffuse along the shore, shoreline. And the same thing we see in peatlands as well. They can be occurring in many different ways. And we are trying to classify this with, with colleagues from Helsinki. Then if we look at the internal flow in the, in the, in the esker itself, this shows the arrows here are the main flow, flow directions. But we want to concentrate now on this lake here, uh, shown here. We made a more detailed study here on the inflow and outflow of groundwater. Say the red is inflow of groundwater, measured by special cylinders. And the blue is the outflow from from the lake to the groundwater system again. And what we can conclude actually here is that the direction of flow is similar to the overall direction of the, of the groundwater flow. So we thought this a little bit important to know. But, in the, but of course, when you look at the water balance for each individual lake, we actually we cannot really do that because each lake in this region are competing for the groundwater. So we must look at the whole aquifer at the same time. First, we, we tried actually to look at a single lake water balance, but that was actually nonsense. But there's more information on these in these papers. Also interesting, if you look at the, the, the rivers coming from the Esker here, uh, the different colors are the different temperatures. So you see it's ranging from 6 to 19. So temperature was quite useful for us as a tracer to look at the, the amount of groundwater in different regions of the discharge area. Well. Then we looked in, in uh, again, a little bit more detail, uh, the, how, the, how the groundwater is influencing peatlands, surrounding peatlands. So here, if you see on the right-hand side, is the, is the uh, groundwater uh, esker. And then the water flows into the peatland system. And when we, the, the key issue here is actually, because this peatland is protected, but the, but the, but the groundwater uh, uh, um, zone is drawn to the edge of the, Esker here, the protection zone. Um, so what we can, s again, we did some flights and some sampling, the flight routes seen here in the, in the black, as black lines, and the sampling, different layers of, we, we took isotope, isotope samples. So basically we sampled isotope after a dry period with no precipitation. So we, gave, we get an evaporative signal. And then we use um, um, a method uh, where we back calculate uh, from the isotope measurement, we back calculate what, what would the groundwater component be in that sample. It's a bit of a complicated back calculation procedure, but it is found in that WRR paper. But what is the key output here, from a practical point of view, is we were able to map where uh, the amount of groundwater and rainwater in different parts of the peatland. So you see the blue, dark blue here are areas where there's a lot of groundwater, 
whereas the lighter areas are areas where it's more precipitation. So we see quite a mosaic pattern here, even during, this is taken during base flow period, during dry period. Then, uh, this is an example from, from, from another peatland again. Here's a, a peatland, and um, this is an esker. And this is the, uh, we look at especially at, at this section here where we did some ground penetrating radar measurements in this edge, this is the boundary of the peatland. And, and what we can see that this peat water in this case flows to the esker, through the esker system here, into the river downstream. So you see here the, the ground penetrating radar and then the soil uh, depth map mapping and different classification. The green is the peatland and the, the brown is the sand aquifer. And why actually, we, so what we noticed here is that the, the peatlands also, they, they, they discharge into these groundwater systems and these eskers. And why this study is particularly important here is uh, this is a long-term uh, flux tower measurements for, for CO2 measurements in, in Finland. And the Meteorological Institute, they noted very high CO2 emissions. And of course, DOC from peatlands if you get a lot of DOC from peatlands going into your aquifer, that, that, will, that will contribute to the CO2 emission and mi may mix up the complete uh, measurement. Because the idea here was to measure fluxes from forestry. So I think that was quite interesting to see how hydrogeology can help uh, uh, studies in, in, in climatology. So. All in all, to, 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 to summarize also a bit here, the aquifer is typically like, like this here, and it's discharging to surface water systems and terrestrial ecosystems, and then through a network of streams. So what we see are peatlands, terrestrial systems. Outside these aquifers, we see also springs and streams. And a work we are uh, working on, or actually submitted, is that uh, we, we're looking at this zone then, after, after the aquifer, the question is, uh, where does the groundwater dominance end? Uh, because of course, eventually it will be a surface water system, but in the beginning it's a groundwater system. So, it's this, so we are trying to, to, to work a little bit with this zonation. Which part is, uh, can be said that it's a groundwater dependent system, so we use, we use a criteria of 50% of groundwater in the river or stream, I say, we call it groundwater system. And then in transition, transition zone will be when it's around 50. And less than 50, it's uh, more surface water dominated into, we are suggesting this type of classification. But the work is not yet accepted. Well, as a summary, uh, GDs, uh, GDs are, are a common feature of the boreal zone. They are found in, of course, many different tidal geological settings in the boreal zone, and including uh, a mix of terrestrial and aquatic systems, so peatlands, uh, streams, uh, lakes, rivers. They often, GDs are often found in the groundwater discharge exfiltration points or zones. Uh, aquifer contact. Uh, in peatlands, it can be, can be quite va variable. It can be uh, uh, like a discharge, uh, I mean groundwater discharging to the, to the peatland. It can be recharge, uh, peatland recharging the groundwater system, or it can be like a flow through system where groundwater flows into the peatland and the peatland water flows out to the groundwater again, like we see in, in lakes. Uh, obviously, hydrogeology is crucial to characterize and understand these GDs, and we need a, a complete picture in a way to, f for, to guide decision making. For example, what is the impact of abstraction? What is the impact of forestry? What is the impact of drainage? What is the role of climate change? But without a proper characterization, we don't really, we're not able to really uh, answer those questions. And for most of the systems that we have, I would say, we don't have a proper characterization. We just have a rough idea. Uh, and I would say that information is often lacking also on the local scale to assess ecosystem processes. 
or the impacts of abstraction, tunnels, drainage, etc. Et so, um, somehow I believe that we need, we need information on, on the, you could say, the, the, the wetland or, or GDE scale and the aquifer scale for, for practical purposes. O obviously, on, on larger scales also for a, lo a lot of reasons, but, but, but for e ecosystems it's important to know also the local scale. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, a couple minutes for uh, questions from the floor. Um, would you like to ask uh, Dr. Clough some questions, please? Yes. Please wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Your penultimate conclusion was about uh, decision making. And I was wondering whether the sort of improved understanding that you were showing about the importance of groundwater to these groundwater dependent terrestrial ecosystems, that spatial differentiation of the groundwater contribution, does understanding, does that higher level of spatial understanding help or hinder decision making because of the extra complexity? Well, uh, like in the Finnish case, no, no, I, I must say also we, we have now a new classification in Finland. We, we, we have um, we have an E type of uh, e, uh, classification of groundwater when when the groundwater system is connected to ecosystems. So that has led. But but the special what we have seen in Finland is that um, nowadays the the aquifer zone, uh, I mean the the border of protected area of the of the of the esker. Previously, it was just drawn on the surface border of the sand deposit, so mainly in the recharge area. So what we see with more spatial information, more detailed information, now they are drawing, extending the, the area to the discharge area as well. I think that's really important because if you, if you mess up, up the discharge area, you, will, you might influence also the, the water level in the recharge area of these systems. So in that sense, yes, I would say so. But, but in the end, uh, what is important in some systems is that some of these for example, these peatlands, they are protected. So th there is the question there, how much abstraction they can tolerate or not. And we have been working with, after, after these studies, we've been working with the municipality that is planning to take out water from this system. And they have reduced the amount of pumping. I mean, the, the permit has been reduced. But we don't know if it's going to help it yet, because it's still, still to see. OK. okay. Um, uh, since we are already running out of time, um, so uh, if you have more questions for Dr. Clough, I'm sure that you can find his publications. He has more than 130 publications in the journal. So, um, and he leaves some contact information uh, in his slides. So please uh, email him for more questions. Um, and uh, please uh, give him another big round of applause uh, for his interesting talks um, for keynote lectures today. And um, on behalf of the uh, 45th uh, IAH Congress organizing committees, uh, we have a certificate of appreciation. I would like to present you a certificate uh, in the, please, uh, at the center of the stage.